welcome back to Web Dev Live. As a Brit, I'm tickled to be kicking off day two from an EMEA-friendly time zone. Yesterday, we spoke about governments doing great work getting the word out on the web. And one of the most inspirational digital services is from the UK, where I saw a government convene online for the first time. Now, we've all been learning how best to work and learn from home. And at Google, we're trying to get a deeper understanding of the needs of web developers, partnering with the community. As one of our close partners, I wanted to invite our friends at Mozilla to chat more about that work and also get information on what's new in their world. Welcome, Kadir and Victoria. Hi, Dion. Great to be here. Hey. So, Kadir, uh, web developers know MDN really well, and many may have participated in the last DNA report. But can you get us up to speed a little bit and tell us about its history and what we're trying to do? Yeah, of course. So this really started in late 2017, shortly after CSS Grid was shipped. CSS Grid was a massive success, but was also years in the making. And layout had been an issue for web developers at least since the 90s when we abused tables to implement our UI designs. So we asked ourselves, how can we have more of these wins? And we talked to people who worked at the web platform um, at Mozilla about how they prioritize things. And one thing really stood out because almost everyone said the same thing. They said, we need to hear more from developers. And it makes so much sense because none of us can be successful without that part. It's hard to prioritize the right thing without knowing about developer pain points. And it's hard to find the right solution, um, especially if it, uh, and, and it's hard to get people to uh, use something if it's not solving their problem or not solving it in the right way. So for, all of those reasons, we proposed a developer needs assessment. And the DNA, in short, uh, is meant to be a single and simple tool for harsh prioritization, representing very diverse populations and a huge feature space. And it's published on MDN, and that's important because it's not owned by a single browser vendor. We initially proposed this under the umbrella of the MDN Product Advisory Board, where we have representation from browser vendors like Google and Microsoft and Samsung, but also the W3C and industry stakeholders. And as a community, we need to have at least a common understanding of the facts when it comes to needs, even if we draw different conclusions from them. And um, for this iteration in 2019, more than 28,000 developers and designers took the 20 minutes necessary to fully complete the survey. And that's from 173 countries total and that's about 10,000 hours of time contributed by developers and designers to help us understand what their pain points and needs are. And we believe that makes the MDM Web DNA the biggest web developer and designer focused survey ever conducted so far. Yeah, well, when you put it that way, uh, I just really want to say thank you to to the community and anyone that, that took the time to uh, go through those you know 20 minutes and getting us the feedback. It's it's incredibly useful to us, but but thank you so much. So when you were going through the results, uh, Kadir, the 2019 report, what kind of really kind of stood out to you? You know, one thing really, uh, and that's web compatibility and interoperability. The four of the top five issues were focused on exactly that topic. And one of the biggest strengths of the web is that there is no single entity controlling the platform, but that doesn't come for free. Uh, web developers and designers are frustrated by not being able to use features, by having to find workarounds, fiddling with browser differences, and also by the difficulty to verify that something that works in one browser will not break in another browser. And related to that, it was a bit of a surprise that uh, the top five issues were extremely stable between very different markets. So whether it's China, India, Japan, the US or France, the top issues for web developers revolve around web compatibility and interoperability. Got it. So when you take this feedback in, uh, how does it actually kind of change the roadmap at Mozilla? Like, what are you now looking to focus on based on this feedback? Yeah, so web, comp web compatibility was already a focus at Mozilla even before this, but we now have doubled down on it. So recently we made uh, browser compatibility data machine readable on MDN, and that's now starting to pay off. So uh, if you use VS Code, a uh, very popular code editor, uh, the 
tooltips have compat data information uh, when you write CSS. And we also recently started a collaboration with caniuse.com uh, to share the data that we have so we are all looking at the same browser compat information. And I'm sure Victoria can say more about it in a moment, but the Firefox DevTools, they now come with compat data information built in. Got it. Yeah, this the feedback has been really uh, helpful for us, uh, and the web platform team is really, you know, working even deeper on stability, compat issues that you talk about, uh, helping with testing, layout, really kind of understanding what what the developer needs are, and kind of bringing it into our prioritization too. So it's actually almost time for the next version of the DNA report. So what do we have in store for developers this time around? Yeah, so uh, one thing we're super excited about this year is to see how things have changed year over year. Um, so we want to see that developer satisfaction go up or down. Um, and how have the top uh, pain points changed? Uh, so this is really the first opportunity to see those trends. Got it. Well, I can't wait to get that out to developers. And I hope that everyone's watching uh, would do us a favor and, and take some time to, to get that feedback in so we can like really know what we can prioritize uh, in the future for our roadmaps. Now, Victoria, I actually used to work on the on developer tools at Mozilla, uh, and not only was it the birth of a you know great tooling in the browser back from Joe Hewitt's you know Firebug onwards, but it really continues to to push the bar. So I'd love for you to be able to kind of catch us up on what's the latest, what's new in uh, uh, in Firefox Dev Tools. Hi, Dan. As Kadir explained, we know that differing browser support for CSS features is a top issue for web devs. So our team built the compatibility panel to make it easier to stay on top of this. It lists all the CSS on your website that's unsupported in certain browsers, as well as deprecated styles. You could try it now in Firefox Dev Edition. I really love the the UX touches there, especially the turtle and the like. That's that's great. And uh, in general, you know, a lot of great features that it, that are landed there. Um, I'm curious if there's anything on the upcoming roadmap that, that you're excited about sharing. We've also been working on the Firefox Profiler. It's our performance tool, which features shareable links for collaboration. We've been integrating the recording UI into Firefox, so it's easy to get started. This tool is also currently in Dev Edition. As far as our debugger, I want to highlight two unique features in 77. We added a type of breakpoint that's new to browser tools, the watch point. It lets you pause when an object property is accessed or changed. Also, we made source mapped variables work. When you pause in an original file, we now reverse engineer the scope chain so that variables look correct in the scopes pane and work in the console. This was six months of incredibly challenging work done by our teammate Logan, who had deep knowledge for being tech lead on Babel the year before. We joke that he's the only person in the world who could have written this. So recently, I really embraced the open design process for a network panel redesign. We set we sent out a survey and posted early mockups to Twitter and got amazing input. I originally used bold to indicate large files, and someone suggested it would be more clear to have mouse and elephant icons for small and big. That's how we ended up with the turtle for slow responses. People also told us that when it comes to the domain column, they mainly want to know if it's third party or not. So in this condensed view with a sidebar, we hid the domain column and added an icon that indicates third party requests. Originally, I made these brightly colored file type icons, and some people loved them and others said it was too much, they look like candy. So I iterated, toned down the colors, and got to the result you see here. Most of this has landed in the latest nightly. We hope everyone will try it out and give us more feedback. Awesome. Great. So Victoria, Kadir, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We really appreciate the great work that Mozilla continues to do for the web. Now you spend a lot of time both in your developer tools and also on the core task of building your app UI. So to chat more about modern web UI, let's welcome Yuna. Hi, Dion. Hi, Yuna. Now we were just talking about the developer needs survey with Mozilla, and there was plenty of feedback from developers on layout. So I was just curious, you know, are there any recent additions to the platform that you think target these needs? Oh yes, we've definitely been listening and CSS has been evolving so rapidly in the past few years and really months. So tomorrow I'll be going over a ton of cool aspects of modern layout with CSS Grid and Flexbox, including how to harness the power of CSS functions like clamp, fractional units, auto placement, the min-max function, justification, 
place items, the repeat function, and a lot more to create robust layouts, breaking down how powerful a single line of CSS can be. There are also some CSS properties coming down the pipeline that will help with a lot of user needs that haven't yet been met. And aspect ratio is one of them. This just landed in Chrome Canary, and it enables users to set defined width to height ratios for media items like images and video. Previously, the way to do this was a hack using padding and calculating a percentage, but now you can set your ratios in a much more readable way. I'm looking forward to this landing in browsers and making a lot of developers' lives easier because I know this is something that I run into a lot. We're also getting the gap property in Flexbox. This one is exciting because of how many times we've just been styling a series of items and wanting there to be space between those items, but not around those items. Gap enables the parent element to control spacing, not the children, making it easier to style these items uniformly within that parent. Currently, you can use Gap to create tracks with CSS Grid, but you'll be able to use it with Flexbox Layout too, meaning you can leverage all of the benefits of Gap with a greater choice and layout mechanism. The Web Animations API is also getting a lot more robust in Chromium 84. Now we have promises, replaceable animations, composite modes, partial keyframes, and a way to access animations from CSS in JavaScript. Check out the blog post on web.dev for more information about these updates and try them out in Chrome Canary yourself. The app property rule is also available behind a flag in Canary, and it's something that I am particularly excited about because this allows for semantic variables in CSS. With app property, you can declare CSS custom properties that have semantic typed values and fallbacks. This is a part of the CSS Houdini effort, specifically the Properties and Values API, and previously was possible in JavaScript with CSS.register property as a part of Houdini, but the app property declaration brings this into our CSS files, meaning a nice co-location of superpowered styles with the rest of your CSS. The other Houdini APIs to keep an eye out for are the typed object model, the paint worklet, animation worklet, and the layout worklet. Great. So JavaScript seems to kind of have its time with uh, the addition of async away, ES modules and the like. Um, it was great to see that evolution. It's really feeling like this is a big time for, for CSS. I love being able to get features that uh, like Gap that you, may, that you mentioned and the like to just make things uh, a lot easier for us and super excited at how deep you can get into on the, on the Houdini side too. But if I use these and I'm building these super rich designs and the like, um, with this great power comes great responsibility. So how do you think about the role of accessibility here? I love that you bring up accessibility because accessibility should always come first. I think you're absolutely right that that needs to be top of mind. Your users need to be able to access your content and navigate your product. It is not an enhancement. I think of accessibility as a core feature. And Chrome 83 actually just launched with some new accessibility testing features, which are pretty neat because they allow for visual accessibility testing. So now through DevTools, you can examine if your UI works for users with various vision deficiencies like blurred vision and four different types of color blindness. Yeah, it's great. We're actually going to have Paul Lewis come on and kind of walk through that a little bit. Um, so thanks so much. I also have really been enjoying your new CSS podcast with Adam Argyle. Not only are you both kind of like really fun to listen to and the like, it's actually been really interesting to watch you kind of go through step by step and kind of teach us the fundamentals. There was a lot that, that I didn't really know about. Yeah, honestly, we are learning so much as we are going through the fundamentals and we're having a lot of fun making these episodes. So if you haven't seen it yet, check out the CSS podcast. Absolutely. So thanks so much for joining us, Yuna, and uh, we'll see you later on the stream. Bye. Now, there are a few more DevTools features I'm really keen to show you, and no one's better to show off a bit of tool in than the ever supercharged Paul Lewis. Hey, Dion, how are you doing? Not too bad. How are you doing, mate? Yeah, pretty good. Thanks. All right. So one of the things that we've noticed is that DevTools puts out these console warnings, as you can see on screen. And if you're anything like me, after a while, you start to ignore them. And the reason is that there just can be quite a lot of them. So we've been thinking about that. And what we decided to do is to bring in the Issues tab. Now, if we detect issues on your page, you'll see this bar across the top with a button in the top right-hand corner there that says Go to Issues. If you click on that, it'll take you through to the Issues tab. Now, it might offer you the opportunity to reload the page to get more information. If you click on one of these items, it'll expand and you can see more information there, as well as potentially some links to content for you to read up on what you could do to fix the issue. So that's the Issues tab. The other thing we've been looking at is Web Vitals. 
So if you go to web.dev slash metrics, you'll see a whole list of metrics here that affect the UX and things that we would like to optimize as web developers. And we've been looking at ways of exposing this information to you inside of the DevTools UI. So things like uh, first contentful paint or largest contentful paint, for example. So if you go to the performance tab in DevTools and you take a recording in the performance tab, you'll see uh, something that looks like this. Now there is an, a timings tab there or timings row, sorry, I should say, uh, across which you'll see these blocks and these relate to some of those metrics. So you can see FCP and LCP, first content for paint, largest content for paint and so on. So you can start to get information there uh, on some of your metrics. The other thing we started doing is to add candy striping to your long running tasks. And you can see that here. I have one task on my main thread that is 70 milliseconds long. And what we're looking for is we're looking for tasks to remain under 50 milliseconds. This means that the main thread stays responsive and hopefully we can respond to user interactions quickly. So as you look around your performance recording, if you see this candy striping effect and the red triangle in the corner, you know that you've got a task that's running longer than 50 milliseconds. What we've also added as well is we've added a total blocking time footer at the bottom. What this tells you is, if you like, the amount of candy striping that you would see across the whole recording. So as you're looking around, if you see that that number's going up, you might want to take a look and see if you have a lot of long running tasks on your main thread. Bringing that down should hopefully help your user experience. Another thing that we've added is this experience track. And what's uh, contained within this is layout shift information. So for example, when you've got uh, buttons and so on on your page and they're perhaps moving around, this can cause uh, UX discomfort. So what we want to do is we want to minimize the amount of moving elements on the page. And so the layout shift here is gonna tell you what elements are, are moving on the page and where and so on and the size that they were when they did it. So if I look at this, uh, I have a warning here, uh, which tells me that cumulative layout shifts can result in poor user experiences. And that's a link to more information as well as information on where it's moved from and to. And if I roll over that, I get an overlay on my screen which shows me exactly where on my page uh, the shift took place. You can also get uh, live information about layout shifts by going to the rendering tab and choosing layout shift regions here in the options. Now I should say that for people prone to photo uh, sensitive epilepsy, this might be a less suitable option because it can cause flashing of overlays on the screen, uh, but it is there as an option if it's suitable for you. The next thing I want to talk about is WebAssembly debugging. Uh, it's an experiment. So if you go into your DevTools settings, go to the Experiments tab and click on WebAssembly debugging, you can switch it on there. What this allows you to do is allows you to do things like setting breakpoints in your WebAssembly code. So here I've compiled a C program. It's just a Hello World program. But what I've done is I've added a breakpoint on the line that says Hello World. So when this code executes and it hits that line inside of the WebAssembly, it pauses execution just like it would inside the JavaScript. And you can see here in the call stack that I can actually take a look at what's going on in that particular frame and I can go between my JavaScript and the C and so on and so forth. So that's something that's coming down and it's currently in Canary. So take a look at that. Now, the last thing I wanna show you is color vision deficiency emulation inside of DevTools. And there's no better way to do that than to actually give you a demo. Okay, so here I am in uh, Chrome Canary and I have a video here running of me and Surma doing supercharged yesteryear. But you can see I have the rendering tab open in DevTools and I can emulate various vision deficiencies such as blurred vision or I can do protonopia. I can do deuteranopia, protonopia, oh sorry, tritonopia <laughs> and achromatopsia as well. And you see the live effect that it has on the page. So these are physiologically accurate emulations of various vision deficiencies. Now, a vision deficiency isn't an on-off thing like we see here, but rather it's a spectrum. So a person could have a, a milder form of a vision deficiency or a more acute form. What we've chosen to implement inside of the DevTools UI is the most acute form. The theory being that as you're optimizing your app for accessibility in terms of color and contrast, if you make it work for the most acute form, then you'll include everything up to and including that as well. So that's color vision deficiency emulation inside of DevTools. Thanks, Paul. I'm really looking forward to seeing more later today. Now, one thing I've noticed as we work from home is how seriously people are taking their home setups, whether it be playing with mics and cameras or virtual backgrounds. And recently I saw a demo that would make you invisible on your video feed using TensorFlow.js. And so I really wanted to learn more. So please welcome Jason Mays from the TensorFlow.js team. 
Hi there, I'm Jason and thank you for the introduction there. It's a pleasure to be invited to the show. And yes, um, I have created an invisibility cloak, so maybe you want to learn more about that. Yeah, Jason, invisibility cloaks are pretty cool. Uh, and so maybe you can show us how web developers can create superpowers like that with TensorFlow. Sure, definitely. So if I switch to my slides for just a second, you can see what the uh, invisibility cloak was that Dion was referring to. And in this uh, demonstration on the right-hand side, you can see as I get on the bed, the bed is deforming in real time and I'm being removed from the bottom frame at the same time. And this is running all in the web browser. Now this is pretty cool because privacy is preserved as none of these images are being sent to the server side. And that's super powerful, especially in today's climate where privacy is top of mind. Now this was created in just under a day, in fact, so it's quite easy to get started with machine learning in the web browser, and we'll see some more demos in just a second. So on that note, I also created a Chrome extension that allows me to use the same stuff we saw before. I was actually using body pics to create that, which gives me this image segmentation of my body in real time. And I can now join a Google Meet meeting, uh, as you can see shown on the slide right now. And this can be combined with my previous demo, so I can remove that second person who comes into frame halfway through the GIF, and then it would appear as if it never actually happened. Cool. So can you give us a few more details on how this all works? So essentially, all this is using uh, body segmentation. And this is running in TensorFlow.js in the web browser. And this can distinguish 24 unique body areas across multiple bodies in real time. You can see on the right-hand side that this works pretty well when all the settings are bumped up to high. And you can even get the pose estimation showing on the bodies too, which estimates where the skeleton is. These can be used in delightful ways, such as clothing size estimation, which you can see here. This is another prototype I created. And I don't know about you, Dion, but I am terrible at knowing what size clothing to buy in my once a year clothing purchase. So Absolutely. here, <laughs> totally. And here you can see, I just enter my height and in less than 15 seconds, I can get an estimate of my inner leg, my chest and waist measurements, which the clothing site can then use to estimate what size I am, a small, medium or large. Now this can even give you superpowers as you see on this next slide. And one of our community members from the USA has combined this with WebGL shaders to turn himself into Iron Man of sorts. And he can shoot lasers from his eyes and mouth using our face mesh model. So this is pretty cool. And it runs buttery smooth at 60 frames per second in the web browser. And you can even go further, of course. There's many web technologies out there that you might want to combine with machine learning, such as WebXR, WebGL, and use those with TensorFlow.js. And if you do that, you can get an example like this from another one of our community members in Paris, France, who can essentially uh, scan a magazine. And if there's a person in it, they can bring that person into the living room full size. You can walk up to them and inspect them in more detail. Pretty cool technology. But of course, after seeing this, I thought to go one step further. And if I add WebRTC, I can then teleport myself anywhere in the world in real time. And this is using a complete rewrite using WebRTC, A-Frame, 3.js, and TensorFlow.js together to create this demo. And it really does make a big difference. When I'm uh, seeing someone in my room, which I can walk up to and move around, it's a massive difference compared to a rectangle that's solid on the screen. So this could be the future of video conferencing, who knows, but uh, it's great to play with these technologies and push the boundaries of the web. That's really cool, from invisibility cloaks to teleportation. Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> this changes everything, essentially. Yeah, totally. So, <laughs> How should web developers, if we kind of zoom out a second, um, uh, how do web developers kind of generically think about the role of ML and TensorFlow.js and how it could fit into their web applications? Yeah, that's a great question. And obviously, right now, in fact, um, machine learning in JavaScript is still a pretty new thing. We're at the very early stages, but that's super exciting too because there's so much potential to be un unraveled at, at this time as well. Um, so on that note, I'd ask web developers to consider how machine learning might fit into their existing pipelines. Maybe you're developing a content management system. In that case, you could potentially use something like uh, automatic image cropping to detect where a human face is in that image. So then you can uh, make sure that it's cropped nicely when you're resizing with your CSS. Or maybe you want to summarize a blog post article. So you have one paragraph of text that shows in the search results. That's now possible with machine learning too, and that can be done automatically. So I think I would encourage people to experiment and, and go outside of the regular box of thinking. And of course, 
On that note, on this side, you can see all the different areas JavaScript can run on the browser, server side, mobile native, desktop native, and even Internet of Things. And TensorFlow.js supports all of these environments too. So maybe you want to combine it with hardware. If you can recognize an object, maybe you can trigger something to happen in the physical world or something on the server side that talks to a third party service. And on that note, TensorFlow.js can essentially run, retrain via transfer learning, or even write, allow you to write your own models from scratch if you so desire. Now, on that note, we have a ton of pre-trained models you can use to get started, such as the body segmentation you saw just a little bit ago, uh, but also things like pose estimation, uh, speech commands, face mesh, hand pose, and some cool natural language processing. And just to dive into that a little bit more, you can see how these models work here. So here's the object recognition in action. This class allows you to recognize 90 pre-trained uh, objects, like these dogs you can see here, and you get the bounding boxes that come back at the same time, which is pretty neat. Or what about this, face mesh, just three megabytes in size, and you can understand 468 unique landmarks on a face. And this could be cool for making like, face masks or some kind of AR experience, such as the one you see on the right. Modiface, which is part of a L'Oreal group, has actually used this for AR makeup try-on, and this lady on the right-hand side is not actually wearing any makeup at all. In fact, she's selecting the color of makeup she wants to try on, and she can do that all in real time in the web browser in a much more hygienic way, which is pretty cool. And then finally, I just want to talk about some of the client-side superpowers you get if we think about running machine learning in the web browser. Uh, the first one is privacy, as we hinted at before. Essentially, because we're running in the web browser, uh, none of that data is ever being sent to a server for classification. So that allows you to access the sensor data in a way that is great for privacy. Linked to that, of course, is lower latency. As there's no server involved, that means there's no 100 milliseconds or so round trip time from the mobile device to the server. You cut that out completely by running on the edge. And of course, lower cost. You might spend tens of thousands of dollars um, hiring beefy GPUs and CPUs to run the machine learning models on your server-side environment. Uh, by running on the client side, all of that goes away because you're using the hardware of the client to run instead. Got it. So how can people get started? You've definitely piqued my interest. Now I want to now I want to start playing. <laughs> Sounds good. So if there's one slide you want to kind of screenshot from today's talk, it would be this one here. On this site, you can find out our website, our models, GitHub code. We are open source, so feel free to contribute. There's a Google group for asking more technical questions. And of course, some great boilerplates to get started on CodePen and Glitch. And for those of you who want to go really deep, um, we recommend the Deep Learning with JavaScript book. That's very comprehensive. And even if you have no background in machine learning, um, as long as you know some JavaScript, it will walk you through everything step by step. So I highly recommend checking that out. And on that note, I would also suggest checking out Teachable Machine right after this show, maybe. In just two minutes, you can use this website to learn to recognize any object in your room. In just 30 seconds, you just take a few images of that thing, hit train, and you'll get a classifier that can then um, classify that object. If you like it, you can then export this model to a JSON format and then use it on any website you like to be more creative and uh, make your own creations using that. And then finally, I'd ask you to come join the community. Uh, we've got this made with TFJS hashtag that you can use that allows you to share what you've made so we can find it and we can invite you to our future show and tells and of course, allow others to get inspired by your great work too. So finally, I just wanna leave you with one more inspirational example. Uh, this guy from Tokyo in Japan is actually a dancer, but he's used TensorFlow.js to make this cool hip hop video. So machine learning really is now for everyone, and I'm super excited to see how creatives will start using this, and not just for academics, musicians, artists, and much, much more. So if you do make something, do use a made with TFJS hashtag so we can find it and share it for you, and I look forward to seeing what you make. And with that, feel free to stay in touch using the following links if you so desire on Twitter and LinkedIn. Great. Thanks so much for joining us, Jason. Yeah, and thanks to everyone who joined me on the day two kickoff. So now let's get to today's sessions, where we focus on updates across our tools and the web platform to make developers more productive, as well as the latest in the world of PWAs. Please enjoy the show, and remember the team is here to chat with you on web.dev slash live and via YouTube. I'll see you there today, and we'll be back tomorrow morning for the day three kickoff.